Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Brown. I am speaking to you from sunny South London at the moment. It is 12, 12 p.m. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to this one hour seminar about mental capacity and decision making and how we avoid biases. Um, I'm here with Sophie and Lisa from Project Perfect, who are going to give a short presentation telling us about the issues of bias around mental capacity, um, why is mental capacity important? Mental health and social care professionals routinely assess the capacity of people to make decisions about their lives in accordance with the Mental Capacity Act 2005. Um, Sophie and Lisa have produced a briefing about how we might avoid biases in that. For all of you at home, this is being live streamed on YouTube. If you're not following it on Zoom, um, you can also join us on the hashtag Mental Capacity 2020, where hopefully you'll be able to submit any questions that you have for Lisa and Sophie, and we'll be able to ask them over the next hour. So I'm going to hand over to Lisa, who's going to introduce herself and Sophie, and then we'll get on with the presentations. Yes, thank you, Mark, and welcome everybody to our webinar. Um, my name is Lisa Bortolotti, and I'm Professor of Philosophy at the University of Birmingham, and I'm with Sophie Stammers today. Um, she is a postdoctoral research fellow also at the University of Birmingham, and we have been working on a project together for quite some time. And today we are here to talk to you about a brief that Sophie prepared on how we can mitigate the risk of assumptions and biases, in the assessment of mental capacity. Great, thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, so by way of uh, an, uh, an overview for today's talk, um, we'll first look at what mental capacity assessment is, um, and then we'll show that values do come into the process. Um, and then we'll show that that means there's a risk of biases and assumptions arising in the process. Then we'll move on to suggest some recommendations that we make in the brief um, and that will include um, looking at training that goes beyond just a one-off commitment um, and which involves dialogue between different groups um, and also we'll look at some procedures which aim to protect um, these assessments from bias. Okay so uh, in terms of what mental capacity assessment is in the first place so health and social care professionals um, as Mark was saying routinely assess the capacity of people to make decisions about their lives. So this, for example, could be decisions related to treatment, such as whether to have a medical procedure um, or a course of medication or an operation, um, or there could be decisions relating to care. So um, such as the location of your care, whether you receive it at home or perhaps in a different facility. So in England and Wales, it's the Mental Capacity Act of 2005, which governs these assessments of capacity. Now, this piece of legislation rejects that uh, the approach of some other countries uh, where the presence of a diagnosis alone is sufficient for professionals to intervene with treatment. Um, and Lisa will talk a little bit um, more about the work that we've done around this, which suggests um, why this is a bad idea. Um, but as I say, the Act itself rejects this approach. Um, and instead aims to assess the person's decision-making abilities in a particular circumstance. So it has these three components. So one is a diagnostic component, and that says, is there any impairments or disturbance? Um, the second is a functional component, and this just asks, is the person able to make a decision in this circumstance? And the third is what's termed the causative nexus, um, all that means is um, it links the, the functional question to the diagnostic one and asks if the person is found to be unable, is that because there's an impairment or a disturbance? So the focus of our brief is really this second one, the functional component. So let's look a bit more closely at that. So the functional component of the assessment essentially looks at how um, a person uses information. So I've quoted from the act itself on the slide um, and it says a person's unable to make a decision for themselves if they are unable to do various things with information relevant to the decision. Now we're most interested in this idea of using and weighing information relevant to the decision. So this sort of assessment can be done using a semi-structured interview, um, but the point is that once you get through this set procedure, 
Uh, and then when you get to the end of that procedure, there's an answer. So the person has capacity relative to the decision at hand or they don't. So what we argue in the notes is that within the process of assessing mental capacity, the necessary decision-making abilities are actually open to interpretation. So for instance, what does it mean to use or weigh information? Um, let's focus in on an example that might make clearer what the issue is here. So when we look at these examples a bit in a bit more detail in the brief, but you have cases where um, people refuse to eat um, and in doing so endanger their lives. Now, sometimes there's a diagnosis of depression or eating disorders. Um, uh, and we, as I say, we talk about these a bit more in the brief. Um, but sometimes these people actually give very clear articulations of their reasons um, and they refer to the relevant information, such as the idea that taking on calories is necessary for life preservation. But still, it's sometimes the case that assessors judge these people to have failed to use or weigh information, and then they're found to lack capacity um, and sometimes given compulsory treatment. Now, it's important to say we're not suggesting that that's the wrong outcome, but we're using this example to show that the outcome depends on whether the assessor thinks that information is making the right sort of difference to the person's decision. And that depends on what the assessor thinks is valuable. So you might think there's a tension between preserving life and preserving autonomy, two things which are arguably valuable, but which seem to come into conflict here. So our point is that following the procedures outlined in the act won't always produce a conclusive answer. In some cases, the assessor has to use their own values. So at this point, I just wanted to invite our audience um, if they could think of any other areas um, in mental health, uh, mental health interactions, or when we just talk to each other about ideas of mental health, where um, our values do come into the conversation, um, do let us know. You can tweet them to the hashtag mentalcapacity2020, and we'll bring them into the discussion after our presentations. Okay, so why is all of this important? Now there's decades of research that shows that human decision-making is susceptible to the influence of irrelevant factors and preconceptions, um, especially when there's uncertainty. So of particular relevance is what's been called implicit bias. Um, and I like the description of this by researchers, Jules Holroyd and Kathy Pittyfoot, who we worked with. Um, now they say that implicit biases are fast, automatic and difficult to control processes that encode stereotypes and evaluative content and influence how we think and behave. So research shows that we harbour biases against members of marginalised groups, for instance, people of colour, women, people with physical disabilities, but also against people with psychiatric diagnoses, as well as people who are neurodivergent. Now, one way to test these biases is to see how quickly people can respond to words about mental health by pressing keys on a computer and having them to do that under time pressure. Um, multiple studies that, that use this kind of test show that we find it easy to match concepts denoting psychiatric diagnoses with concepts such as dangerousness, incompetence, unpredictability or helplessness. And this equates to stronger implicit bias. So the idea with these tests is that by requiring us to react quickly, they're tapping into our automatic processing and they reveal biases that can arise in our behaviour without our realising. You can see references um, uh, to these sorts of tests and other paradigms that we use to test biases in the brief. So there's evidence to suggest that most people harbour these biases um, and that extends to mental health care professionals. Um, so one study featured employees uh, uh, working for an organisation that specialised in care and outreach for people experiencing mental distress. So in this study, the professionals underwent those fast reaction tests for implicit bias, and then were given a questionnaire. Those found to have higher levels of negative implicit bias report that they would be less certain that they would help a person with a mental illness in that questionnaire. There was another study that surveyed 400 professional clinicians and 275 clinical psychology graduates. And it showed that those with negative implicit biases are more likely to overdiagnose patients on the basis of a description of those patients' symptoms. That is, they suggest the presence of more illnesses. So the overall point here is that because assessors have to make value judgments in mental capacity assessments, um, that means that there's a risk that these kinds of stereotypes can sneak into the procedure. So what can we do about this? 
Um, now, at this point, I'll hand over to Lisa, who can tell you a little bit more about the sort of work that we've been doing that we think answers this question. Thank you, Sophie. So um, in the last five years, uh, I've been leading a project funded by the European Research Council and called PERFECT. And our main focus in the project was to look at some beliefs and some behaviors that uh, we would normally consider as irrational. So let's say a belief that is not well supported by evidence or a belief that we hang on to, even if we've got plenty of counter evidence um, for against that belief. So in these cases, what we want to ask, what we wanted to ask in the project is uh, whether um, these kind of beliefs and behaviors have any benefits that maybe are hidden from view and explain why we tend not to dismiss uh, beliefs and behaviors that are irrational despite their irrationality, despite the potential costs that they have uh, for us, for our lives, for our interactions with other people. The main aims of the project that are relevant to the brief today are um, the attempt to enhance our understanding of the relationship between rationality and agency. So philosophers, philosophers of mind, philosophers of psychology, but also um, anybody interested in how the mind works have been uh, associating our capacity to interact with other people interact in our physical environment, intervene on our physical environment, being agents um, with our rationality and assuming rationality is a necessary condition for our agency, which just means that if we are not rational, then we do not uh, exhibit agency, we're not good agents and we fail to interact in a meaningful and productive way. And the project is really challenging that idea, suggesting that sometimes there is agency without rationality and the even more provocative idea that sometimes it is irrational beliefs and irrational behaviors that make us better, more effective at interacting in the world. The second idea that I think is really one of the aims of the project and is also extremely relevant to the brief today is that we want to undermine the theoretical foundations of mental health stigma. What do we mean by theoretical foundations? I think the most common reaction to mental health stigma is to say that discriminating people because of their poor mental health is unethical. And that's a perfectly good approach, but we want to go beyond that. It's not just that it is unethical because we deprive them of opportunities and equal treatment, but it's also inaccurate given what we know about how the mind works, because there is no substantial difference between people with and people without a psychiatric diagnosis. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, the two key ideas of PERFECT that we want to stress in the brief. The first, of, the first one is continuity, which is basically just what I've been telling you. We are all irrational in some circumstances. Uh, we are superstitious, uh, we are prejudiced. Sometimes we hang on to beliefs that have been discredited long ago, and we tend to have a self-financed view of ourselves and our skills. Um, that type of irrationality that we exhibit on an everyday basis that we see in the people we interact with is the same type of irrationality that we find in people with psychiatric diagnosis. They don't have a special type of irrationality um, and they are not uh, different in that particular way. I think it's very important for the brief and for what Sophie will be telling you later also to um, remember that sometimes one irrational belief or a set of irrational behaviors do not mean that the person as a whole is irrational and therefore unable to uh, make good decisions. So we shouldn't think of irrationality as a global phenomenon when associated with mental health and especially poor mental health. The second key idea is benefits as well as costs. So yes, irrational behaviors have a lot of costs. Um, if I have a self-financed view of myself, Certainly, I will have a compromised understanding of how good I am at certain tasks, and I will not make good predictions about my future. But it's also possible that irrational behaviors have some benefits, maybe short-term benefits or local benefits. So maybe my self-financed view of myself will help me gain confidence uh, when I'm facing a particularly difficult moment. And that's the idea that we want to stress. Sometimes symptoms of uh, mental disorders that are considered to be irrational 
may compromise understanding that's possible that may also play a useful function maybe a response to a crisis and therefore we shouldn't dismiss them so easily and i'm sure that you in the audience have plenty of examples of cases like that of behaviors that or beliefs that are irrational but are actually useful in some circumstances and if you do you can tweet um hashtag mental capacity 2020 and let us know what your examples are in the last slide, I just want, in the last slide of my section, I just want to tell you a little bit about how these two ideas, continuity and benefits as well as costs, um, are important to mental uh, capacity assessments. And Sophie will um, go through the details with you um, in the next part of the presentation. So why is it that continuity and benefits as well as costs matter to mental capacity assessment? Well, when professionals assess people's capacity to make decisions, it is possible that some ideas are some associations between mental illness, let's say, and irrationality affect the way they make their decisions. These could be stereotypes, maybe associating schizophrenia with dangerousness or depression with laziness. We know they are not uh, well-founded associations at all, um, but sometimes they are there in popular culture, in what we read in, in the newspapers, in, in, in depictions of poor mental health, and they might affect the way in which people reason and people decide. What we want to suggest is that the effects of stereotypes can be reduced if we challenge that association between mental illness and irrationality, as we did in the project, and as can be done uh, on a larger scale, possibly through training. And I let Sophie explain all about that now. Great, thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, I think it's worth saying with the strategies um, that a lot of organisations use that exist out there at the moment um, tend to be sort of one off. Um, sometimes they're even like exercises you do on a computer um, and the research suggests, uh, well, first of all, there's kind of no quick remedy that ensures um, that the kinds of biases that might arise in the sort of decisions that we have to make e.g. in capacity assessments, but you know, wider decisions in mental health, um, there's, there's, there's no kind of quick fix to, to make those decisions better. Um, and those one-off interventions where you have people just doing tick box exercise essentially on a computer um, really aren't effective in the long term. So we need something different there. Um, so there are some interventions that are more likely to make a positive impact. So I think, so maybe I can discuss what we did during Project Perfect. So we actually developed a training model um, that had the form of a series of workshops and it aimed to reduce assumptions that arise in mental health discourse and practice. And our approach was, as Lisa was just discussing, to try and promote understanding by encouraging people to reflect um, on those theoretical and social bases for their assumptions and biases. Um, and our workshop series incorporated two elements which are associated with longer term positive behavioural changes. Um, and that was ongoing participation. So um, in one of the iterations, we did six sessions over as many weeks. Um, and as I was just mentioning, you know, um, uh, research does suggest that we need a required commitment, sort of ongoing engagement um, to make a difference. Um, but perhaps the most important feature I'd like to draw your attention to is what's two on the slide there. Um, so we ran our workshops with groups of both mental health professionals and people with a lived experience um, and gave them the opportunity firstly to share their experiences in a, in a safe environment, but also to understand the commonalities between um, experiences by drawing on um, underlying models and, and using philosophical techniques to get there. So that draws on what's known as the intergroup contact hypothesis, um, which shows that one way to reduce biases um, in the longer term is to have people from different backgrounds engage in a meaningful task together and to do that on an equal footing. And this is something that came up as being successful in feedback um, from our workshop. So um, participants talk about going on a shared journey together, even if they didn't all end up with the same conclusions. And in fact, there's a podcast by workshop participants that mentioned this, which we'll link some tweets and uh, we'll tweet about. So what we propose in the brief is that we could do something like this model and we'd adapt it for training professionals who are uh, involved in mental capacity decisions. Um, and we also would want to work with relevant stakeholders to complement existing training in this area. And we say a bit more about this in the brief. 
Um, but I just want to draw your attention to one particular recommendation, which we call prioritizing the functional component. So remember that mental capacity assessments have those three components, the diagnostic one, the functional one, and the causative nexus. Um, and now that's the order that you're uh, supposed to do them according to the code of practice for the Mental Capacity Act. But there's a problem here. The risk of stereotyping is likely to be exacerbated when you put the diagnostic aspect uh, of the assessment prior to the functional one. And that's because stereotypes relating to diagnostic categories have been primed, making them more likely to affect judgments um, in the subsequent functional aspect of the assessment because it sits downstream in the procedure. So here's the recommendation. Um, and it turns out actually if you go with the wording of the act, and um, this has been sort of proven in case law, um, actually it encourages you to prioritize the functional aspect of the assessment. So if you do it this way round, um, you carry out the functional aspect uh, of the assessment with a mind that hasn't just been focusing on diagnostic concepts. Um, and that means you're less likely to be thinking about the person you're assessing through the lens of their diagnosis. The stereotypes are less likely to affect your reasoning. Now, obviously it's difficult for practitioners when both the act and the code of practice are long complex documents and they pull in different directions. Um, but actually there's a new code of practice on its way and we'd really like to see the functional component prioritized here. But as part of the training that we're proposing, we'd like to focus on strategies which insulate that functional component of the assessment from the risk of stereotypes and biases, um, like having it prior to the diagnostic aspect. So I leave up a slide there with the recommendations that we're making. Um, so that second one, as I just mentioned, um, facilitating those procedures to try and um, stop bias arising, uh, but also uh, incorporating that meaningful dialogue between different groups. Um, and I'll just finish by saying that in the note, we say that we're um, looking at different formats for training. And um, so that could include a series of CPD days for practitioners, but also online training would be possible. Um, and I guess that's probably how a lot of our training in the um, short to medium term is probably going to look. So with that in mind, it's really good for us to start tapping into these online communities that already exist around this topic. So we're really grateful for you um, for tuning in and helping to start um, build those virtual networks with us that are going to be necessary for this sort of work, um, at least going forwards um, uh, yeah, in the sort of short term. Um, so we'd like to say thank you for listening and perhaps we can move to the discussion. I think we definitely can move to the discussion. Thank you for that, both of you. There's a lot to chew over there. I think one of the things I'm aware of is we are broadcasting out into the wider world. We're not sitting in a room in a university or a room in a mental health trust or a social care organisation. Um, my, my first question to both of you, being aware of the fact that there may well be some people who are listening into this lecture, listening into this this webinar, whatever we're calling it, um, who aren't familiar with some of the ideas. And the first thing I wanted to pull out and ask you both about was the idea of this causative nexus. What does that actually mean in practice for how people think about this issue of mental capacity? That's a really good question. Um, and I think the honest answer is to say that um there aren't really there's there's no again it's there it's difficult really to determine what really um what information a person is drawing on and whether the ways they draw on that information are affected by any underlying conditions or experiences of distress that they observe so you're always really just looking at someone's behavior and asking them to tell you their perspective but that's a very different thing to saying that we have direct access to someone's mind um, and the committee for the um, uh, convention uh, on the rights uh, of uh, people with disabilities has drawn this out uh, uh, with the with regards to the mental capacity act and said it's a real issue it's very hard to determine um, how to assess that that causative nexus part any thoughts on that, Lisa? No, I think um, Sophie just, just explained it really well. It's just a question of thinking about the role 
of the knowledge that we have about a person having a certain diagnosis in the way in which we make decisions that might affect that person's life. Um, so it could be uh, that sometimes knowing that someone has uh, been diagnosed with a specific condition is actually very helpful. It might give us a lot of information about what they may be experiencing. Um, but in some circumstances, it also carries a lot of associations that we may need to distance ourselves from in order to make decisions that are really based on the individual that we've got in front of us and their current situation rather than um, that individual six months before um, or, or a situation that is actually different from the one that we are facing. So I think the point is that not that diagnosis, you know, is not important or that information that we can get uh, about a person given their diagnosis should be dismissed or disregarded. That's not the point. It's rather how should we use it? Let's use it critically. You know, there's not just assume that everything that a diagnosis might suggest about the person is true of that person before knowing more about that person and what their interests are in, in the situation in which we need to make decisions about assessment of mental capacity. Cool. So my kind of follow-up question to that is thinking about these concepts, you've got legal concepts, you've got philosophical concepts, you've got ideas about bias, we've got ideas about agency, all of these kind of things. Um, my question to both of you, and you can jump in whoever wants to go first, is what does it look like when we get this right in practice in our relationship with people? And what does it look like when we get it wrong? Because it's quite, quite easy for someone to go, either this is the most important issue in the world or it doesn't matter at all. So I, I'd, I'd like us to kind of explore a little bit what it looks like if we get it wrong, what it looks like if we get it right. Sure. And I'll throw that over to you. <laughs> Yeah, so I think I will let Sophie answer the answer this question more specifically uh, in relation to mental capacity assessments because she's the expert there. Um, I just want to say that um, in some respects, this is not an issue that is uh, specific to mental health. I think we are every time we are interacting with other people, um, we have certain labels that we use to try and understand what those people may be about and try to predict what those people will do, especially if we don't know them very well. Um, it may be woman, it may be a person of color, it may be a person with a disadvantaged background and so on. Those labels are useful, somehow they are inescapable, like we cannot kind of stop thinking about people in those terms, but they carry associations Sometimes they're positive associations, sometimes they're negative associations. When, when the interaction goes well, those associations do not interfere with the way in which we value the person's contribution, let's say, to the conversation. So, for instance, Mark, when you talk to me, knowing that I'm a woman, uh, the fact that I'm a woman doesn't uh, prevent you from thinking that when I talk about science or logic, I'm making sense, right? So you're not uh, thinking, oh, Lisa is a woman. That means that she's really bad at maths. And, you know, whenever she talks about science or logic, I shouldn't listen to her. So th that's not to mean that any association that you have about women is going to be unhelpful or negative but you are not letting the negative ones interfere with our conversation. You are taking me at face value. You're not imposing on me as some kind of general frame that society might have, because it's not people's fault really, right? We are conditioned into these kind of frames um, that society has, has suggested. When the interaction goes badly, uh, those frames interfere. And so I may be making perfect sense when I'm talking about science, but you still tend to think that, oh, you know, uh, the kind of white bearded guys got it right and, and Lisa's got it wrong just because he fits the stereotype of a scientist or of an intellectual and I don't. And I think that applies to, to the mental health context perfectly. So it's perfectly okay to think that knowing that someone has been diagnosed with depression is meaningful and informative and can help us modulate our interaction with them, but it becomes bad when, you know, the idea that they may be weak or lazy which is a common association with depression, unfortunately, 
affects the way in which I'm listening to them, affects the contribution that they make to the conversation. Cool, Sophie, what, what, yeah, what so, have you got? Yeah, I'll add to that um, uh, by, by bringing uh, sort of a lot of what Lisa said to um, apply again to uh, some of this, some of the stuff that actually we were talking about with people who contributed um, to the brief. So I think when it goes wrong, I mean, one thing to do is to look at examples in case law where capacity assessments get overturned. And often they get, um, if you uh, look at uh, what the judges have uh, recorded in terms of why the decision has been overturned, often it um, relates to issues that, that Lisa was just discussing there. So um, it seems like people do uh, make sort of assumptions that actually, if you look at the evidence that was that was given and you look at what was recorded in the assessment itself, um, that assumption doesn't seem warranted and that comes up in these cases. And we've discussed some of these in the brief um, as well. Um, uh, I, I think it's, I mean, we should stress that these are really complex decisions and um, I don't think what anything we've said here suggests that there's, uh, for any particular decision, we have the answer. We say, uh, we can say, uh, yes, there's capacity here. Yes, there's not. So it is complex. Um, but I think it's also important to uh, hear from the people who've gone through this, so people with lived experience of this, um, uh, particularly when we look at when we look at solutions and involve them in the conversation, because there's um, a, a twofold benefit there. One is obviously we're getting uh, direct experiences of the process and what we can improve. Um, but uh, the other aspect is that we're drawing on this intergroup contact um, uh, 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 idea where actually we're reducing our biases through that process. Um, in terms of what happens when it looks right, uh, when things go well, I think there's still a lot of work to be done just in um, getting across the idea that even though the Mental Capacity Act is protective um, in some senses, it also does still involve uh, practitioners to use their own values. Um, and in fact, as we were discussing this idea and the project um, with uh, various practitioners, um, it was only just, uh, you know, I, I suppose that there is this very defined procedure. And um, we did have a couple of conversations where uh, practitioners were like, oh, there can't be values here because there is this defined procedure. But then we sort of teased out, you know, how are you understanding this aspect of the procedure? And then they would say, oh, yes, of course, there is a sort of values that have to come into it. Um, Another thing to say is that when it looks right, that doesn't mean we get rid of our values um, that are necessary to, uh, uh, to, to, to make these um, decisions because um, there is no sort of value free way to do this. Um, we're uh, it, in some senses actually going forwards. What we have to do is just make it clear that our values are involved um, and communicate that to people who are involved in these assessments. And there's actually lots of um, good projects kind of going ahead with this already. And we mentioned those in the brief. Um, so, so it's that first, that educational element, first of all, um, and then working directly with practitioners to say, well, um, what does your process look like? What are the procedures that you're using already? And then can we move to um, uh, redesign those procedures to, uh, as far as we can to insulate people from, uh, sorry, insulate the assessors from um, uh, any information that's just not relevant to that question of can this person use information in this way at this time? Um, so if they don't need to know any diagnostic information, um, then that's great. Sometimes they have to, sometimes that, that is just part of the process, but there will be cases in which that diagnostic information isn't necessary. Um, so that's the idea. Absolutely superb um, answers. Thank you for expanding on them in such great length. We're already getting some questions in from the hashtag, which is mental capacity 2020 on Twitter, um, which I'll ask in a moment. One of, one of my questions around this issue and around mitigating the issue of biases is the kind of very human response to being accused of having a bias, which is to say, I have values, you have biases. And I think that is a very, very difficult one because even the decision to enter into providing care for someone as your profession is a set of value judgments. And one of the challenges, certainly in mental health, is the balance between the moral obligation to prevent harm and the moral obligation to ensure autonomy and freedom and observance of human rights. Um, this is kind of sometimes an issue in the conflict, perhaps between mental capacity and the Mental Health Act. Um, 
how do you how do you in training how do you in preparation how do you in practice get over that barrier that you know one person's values or another person's biases okay i think i'll do the same i'll just say something general and let sophie do all the hard work um i think that I think what Sophie just said earlier is very important. So values and biases are something we're stuck with. We are not getting rid of them. And that's why we're talking about mitigating the effect of biases. We're not talking about getting rid of biases, um, partly because biases are there to help us manage overwhelming amounts of information that our limited cognitive capacities could never uh, process properly. Um, if we didn't have shortcuts and biases. So biases are there for a reason, are there because there is so much to know and, and, and there isn't enough resources in, in our capacity for, for knowing um, to allow us to just uh, get all the relevant information and only the relevant information. So we need those shortcuts. And you're absolutely right that what for someone is a bias for someone else is not a bias is is a belief that they have acquired given their own experiences so it's it's not a belief that they have acquired just because society has conditioned them to think in that way but they've had experiences that have led them to uh, think about things in, in in that way and um and the point is not that that way of thinking is not valid or that it is irrational is rather than we can all critically uh, try to distance ourselves from our beliefs and values. Just ask questions, you know, why do I believe that this is the case? Have I ever encountered a situation where this particular belief proved wrong, didn't help me, didn't make me do the right thing? Um, and it's much easier if we do it in groups, which is Sophie's point about the workshop, rather than if we do it in our armchairs, because in our armchairs, we tend to always think that we are right and nobody is challenging us. Well, if we do it in groups with people who have different backgrounds and different experiences, our mind opens to consider the other person's point of view. That doesn't mean that we will end up agreeing with them. The disagreement will stay li likely, at least some of the disagreement will stay, but our understanding of their own perspective will change. And, and that's so important because, and that's the last thing I'm going to say, sorry, but sometimes the stigma that we talk about that is associated with mental health is self-stigma. Sometimes those biases are biases that we have about our own behavior. We tend to see ourselves as weak, as lazy, as not good at maths and so on, um, because the message is out there and the message is reinforced sometimes, unfortunately, by the press and by people around us and so on. So to learn to be critical about the way we think about things is beneficial to our interactions with other people, but it's also beneficial to the way we think about ourselves. Because sometimes we think we cannot do things, so we think our contribution is not valuable just because we haven't thought critically about these kind of messages that we get. Sure. Great. And is that setting you up, Sophie, well for another answer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to build on a little bit of what Lisa said there, I think um, the as much as we can do to kind of step back and, and involve ourselves in training that isn't necessarily directly about in this moment doing an assessment, what can I do generally to make myself firstly just more aware of uh, the, the way that cognitive, our cognitive processes kind of work generally, um, that helps us later on down the line to then um, hopefully identify them in our in our practice um, but I think um, actually approaches in practice have to be quite tailored and have to be um, specific so that they do engage with the actual procedures um, that practitioners uh, face so they're sort of realistic in that setting. Um, I mean some people have said and I'm not an expert on the legislation but some of our contributors have mentioned that we don't involve families quite as much or involve um, uh, nominated supporters um, uh, in the UK, uh, sorry, in England and Wales, as much as other jurisdictions. Um, but sometimes uh, that's, uh, it, it's difficult because uh, that's not, you know, um, sometimes support ne networks around the person aren't always safe, they can be really complex. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's very, it's very difficult kind of working out how to resolve some of these tensions. Um, 
uh, yeah, but I think um, making the uh, making your reasoning transparent as well in the in the um, uh, when you are making an assessment is really important. Um, it's, I think we should point out that the majority of capacity assessments don't reach, um, you know, don't aren't overturned um, in the courts, so they don't reach courts. But those that do, like, I think it's really important to show uh, why you came to the decision that you came to, um, and then use that as a, as a learning process. Um, so I think that would be um, some of us. Cool. So we have actually had some questions in from Twitter, which I am going to I'm going to read out for you. Um, we have a question from, from Dolly Sud, who has asked, would, <laughs> would the results of your study and your project have been different if you were talking to professionals in general medicine? So people who worked in surgery, cardiovascular, what is the understanding amongst other medical professionals and other professionals around this issue of mental capacity? Because I'm guessing the subtext of that question is there may well be some strong differences. Okay, so in our project, we didn't really do empirical work ourselves, but we reviewed empirical work that had been done in, in the context of implicit bias and in the context of also uh, consultations uh, between um, mental health care professionals and people with mental health issues. Um, my hunch would be that we would find uh, the effects of implicit bias in all interactions uh, featuring professionals um, where there is kind of a power dynamics that is uh, particularly strong. But I also think that the case of mental health um, is quite uh, special in many ways. Um, and one example of this would be, for instance, um, the idea that in some consultations, uh, the person who, who has less power in the relationship tends to be uh, listened, but often her opinions and uh, her contributions to the conversations are dismissed. Now, we can definitely imagine this kind of situation in uh, any kind of branch of medicine happening. You know, when you go and see your GP or a specialist and you talk about your problem, um, very often you find that the person is kind of, um, and again, this is absolutely necessary in the time frame of the kind of interaction, selecting the kind of things that you're saying and, and focusing on some and just kind of neglecting others. And it looks as if this is kind of, um, exacerbated in, in the context of mental health, where sometimes the person report of their own experience is thought to be the result of their symptoms or of their condition, rather than a, a genuine contribution that she is making to, to the consultation. And I think the reason why that's more strong in mental health is exactly what we were talking about, that there is this assumption that uh, many mental health conditions, if not all, uh, imply some kind of irrationality or inability to know yourself, inability to present evidence about your own health in a kind of reliable way, an accurate way. Um, and I think challenging that assumption goes a long way actually in, 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 in inviting uh, professionals um, to kind of listen to the person with open eyes and open ears and sometimes what the person can say about their own experiences is so important to the clinical outcomes and to the possible treatment options um, because after all it is our experience that is part of our mental health. So I think uh, my answer should be that in the case of mental health consultations it, it, it interactions where there is a strong power dynamics may even disadvantage uh, the service users more than other types of interactions. Cool. So we got we got actually as you were speaking there a, a question from Isabel Norrington, which was, um, if the diagnosis element of um, the mental capacity assessment causes so much bias, could we not just do without it? Um, give you a chance to chew that one over. Um, not so necessarily just you, Lisa. Yeah, um, I think I think it's a it's a really good question. Um, so. So one thing is to stress that the, um, the diagnostic component of the assessment isn't the same thing as someone generally being given a diagnosis. So that 
and the questions around should we give people diagnoses, um, which I think are completely valid, um, kind of sit alongside uh, alongside this this question, which is is giving someone a diagnosis in the instant that we're trying to find out how are they making this decision and can we consider uh, um, can we take on their consent or their refusal um, it, it's really just relevant to that that question so the, the idea is if all you really need to know is can that person make a decision um, or do they need to be supported in this instance it's sort of irrelevant in in some in some cases um, to then find out for instance that they have a diagnosis of say uh, bipolar disorder or um, you know so I think um, that's that's the idea that we're that we're sort of speaking to and I think that there um, it, it, it is entirely possible to run through the functional assessment and just look at what the person needs in order to to make a decision for themselves without thinking at all about um, the, the their diagnosis and what the diagnosis might mean and um, so with the broader question of should we make diagnosis at all, I, I, yeah, I think that's a, a really valid question. And um, but I also think it's important to say that um, that you know there's uh, probably there's pl it's important to say there's plurality around this issue. So I wouldn't want to um, commit to any one particular uh, answer to that because I think for some people diagnosis is important. It validates experiences. And for others, it's a way, um, uh, it's sort of a practical uh, or pragmatic thing because it allows you to access support. Um, but then for other people, um, a diagnosis and, and the kind of labelling that comes with it just isn't um, isn't helpful. So I want to respect that plurality whilst also saying that um, just getting this this functional question um, uh, addressed in the Mental Capacity Act doesn't always need to reference diagnostic concepts at all. Excellent. So. Another follow-up question from, from Dolly Sud, which is, in your research and your project, did you find there were any trends amongst the professionals that you talked to in terms of attitudes or biases or approaches to this question? Were, were, were younger, younger professionals more likely to hold certain attitudes or certain approaches than older? Did it split by gender? Did it split by profession? Um, did you find anything like that in the work you're doing? Lisa, do you want to answer this one? Yeah, so maybe, uh, Sophie, you can talk about the studies that you're mentioning, you were mentioning in the slides about uh, attitudes yeah. of, uh, of healthcare professionals. Um, I have to say that in um, my own experience of these type of studies, so for instance, one person that was doing excellent work is Rose McCabe at City University. She does conversation analysis and she looks at interactions between uh, clinicians and, um, and service users. And she looks at how clinicians talk, but also uh, all the kind of nonverbal um, behavior that they might have when they engage in consultation, the gaze uh, and the expression and so on. And she found that uh, there is definitely um, a way of coding by, by filming and, and transcribing these interactions, the, the kind of phenomenon that we were talking about when the person makes a contribution and is dismissed. Um, but I uh, can't remember that she actually um, makes any point about distinctions in terms of uh, gender or, or age of the practitioner in this, in this respect. So I don't know whether we've got sufficient data to make this kind of uh, judgments. Maybe Sophie knows more. Um, no, it's just to really underline that point, which is that, um, yeah, so the, the implicit biases that we were mentioning um, in the presentation um, arise uh, in virtue of features of, of just the way that humans process information. Um, uh, so they're sort of facilitated and they, and they come into being because of that, and that's common to everyone. Um, I, I suppose there's a, a further question, which is what are the inputs to these biases? Um, so the idea is they sort of track cultural ideas, which are available to everyone. So for instance, you know, so um, the way that we represent mental health in the media is often really biased. Um, and I think uh, when I, I was mentioning that we often, uh, uh, that we can, we can do these tests, which show that we have strong association, uh, associations between um, uh, mental health com concepts, particularly things like schizophrenia, and we associate that with dangerousness. And, and you might answer, you might wonder why, but then you look at the uh, impressions that we get from the media and you can sort of see where these assumptions, uh, where these biases um, 
uh, sort of get fed. So I guess, yeah, there's, there's, there's one thing, which is that um, the, the way that human information processing works just means that we will have these biases. But then the, the, the second question is, well, what's the content of these, of these biases? Where do they get their particular contents from? Um, and that's kind of from, you know, it's really it's from the um, cultural ideas that we're exposed to. And we're sort of, the, I think the studies show that we're sort of reasonably exposed to similar things there. Um, there would be a further question, which would be if someone had never encountered um, anyone who'd been given a particular diagnosis or experienced mental distress, um, what would their biases be? But of course, it's very hard to run those studies because people don't grow up isolated from cultural concepts. So, um, it, you know, it's hard to answer that question. Really. So we just had, we had a comment again from the hashtag Mental Capacity 2020, which is from Winnie M, which she, you know, Winnie says, if we want to aim for the elimination rather than the mitigation of bias, since the case that boundedly rational diagnoses will always be subject to stereotypes due to their cognitive limitations, what do you think about the use of perhaps ideally rational AI? So how do you feel about taking humans out of the equation completely? <laughs> So this is an excellent question. Um, again, I'm going to say my very general thing, and then Please. Sophie, I'm coming with a more expert view. But um, there are people actually studying this. Uh, it's not our research group, um, but uh, there are people studying the impact of certain apps, for instance, that are used also for mental health purposes, um, for um, like impacts on, on young people, for instance, experiencing um, uh, psychotic symptoms and um, how they fare in comparison with like the human, <laughs> with the human approach. And I think the jury is very much out because these are new studies. And so it's quite important to be open-minded about this until we get some empirical evidence and um, they might support one view or the other. I guess my hunch based on conversations that I had with let's say Professor Elena Singh in Oxford who is doing some of this work uh, on digital um, health is that um, there will be advantages and disadvantages. So clearly, if you don't know who is facing you on the other side, um, and you don't know whether it's a woman or a man, you don't know whether it's um, young or old, you don't know whether they are uh, black or white, uh, then what you're going to say to these people may not be influenced by the kind of associations that you, you have um, with those labels. So it may be that there is a liberating effect from biases <laughs> that you know the less information you are given about the person you are chatting with, let's say, uh, means uh, fewer negative associations that you may have in relation to that person. That doesn't mean that all biases or assumptions are going to be eliminated because who is designing these digital apps? I mean, who is programming them? It's, it's humans, right? And humans will have their own assumptions. So I think that the answer, which I don't know yet, but the answer will be very much good for some things, not so good for other things. And certainly it kind of the human touch uh, I think in a good practitioner is something irreplaceable and something that we don't really want to give up, I guess. Mm -hmm. Sophie, any more thoughts? Um, no, I think that's, um, I think you summarised it really nicely. Um, I think there might be, um, uh, so sometimes we can use technology uh, which enables us, us to anonymise um, inputs like um, names or um, any other uh, uh, like data that might give you an idea of the person's social identity, which might then activate biases, and I think that's really useful. But as Lisa's saying, if you are relying on um, uh, designing a program that enables you to just uh, kind of, to, you know, to, to make these decisions for us, um, as Lisa was saying, well, that's that program is going to be designed by humans, and humans are going to therefore be filling those inputs with biases that they kind of already have. And um, another approach is to actually just look at kind of um, I suppose try and determine what the princi best principle should be by looking, looking at large data sets. But then again, where's that data coming from? Because, um, you know, there's no sort of, uh, you know, I get, humans are, I, I guess, putting their ideas into the way that we represent information, you know, are you pulling ideas off the internet? Well, that's not kind of just natural data. It's very much um, perceived and, and chosen through, um, I, I guess, the, what, what humans think are valuable. So it's hard to know how to begin that approach. Um, uh, even if we could design something theoretically that would enable us to make those decisions, it's hard to know how we'd start to do that, I guess. Yeah, because of course the, the, the important thing with this is that these decisions do have to be made. The, the easiest way to remove bias 
is to not make any decisions at all, which would be a bias in itself. Right, we've got five minutes or so at the end. I want to fit in one final question, which is kind of very, very much drawing us back to the here and now. It's a question from Dave Mundy on Twitter. Um, he was asking for your views around this issue and the current emergency legislation around COVID-19, because um, there are some alterations to how things might work. Um, so there will be some decisions being made that are very uncomfortable and based on a whole variety of different biases, potentially. Um, it's a bit of a dark one to, 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 to have as, as the final question, but I think it's very important. Um, so if either of you would like to jump in, that would be excellent. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on, on the Mental Capacity Act and uh, on the effects that the revisions will have on, on people um, experiencing um, the need to, uh, um, to be uh, the object of this kind of assessment. I've seen some in very um, thought-provoking and interesting commentaries, for instance, by Akiko Hart, uh, from the uh, National Service User Network, suggesting that if uh, changes are necessary, then they should be reviewed um, uh, at brief intervals of time and not just assumed as the new norm for a long time. Um, because the situation in which we are is a situation that affects us all globally, but also um, brings a lot of uncertainties. Um, in any aspect, in all aspects of our lives, actually, our working life, our family life, our health, and the way in which our health is managed. So um, I think uh, I don't have anything new to contribute uh, on top of what Akiko was uh, was talking about. But I think any revisions that we make that might be necessary at the moment for practical reasons should be something that we review um, critically when uh, I hope soon. Uh, the level of emergency that we're facing is reduced. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. I think um, I think Lisa, um, uh, yeah, summarised that really well. Um, I don't really have much further to add than other, you know, other than to say that um, I, yeah, so so having them um, reviewable and time limited and open to scrutiny as we move through what is clearly a, a, a global crisis that we all need to um, admit that changes are going to be made but to have those those changes time limited and open to scrutiny um, by opposition parties but also um, by uh, sort of broader de democratic processes I think that's really important. Excellent. So we're kind of we're moving to the end of our hour now. I'd like to give both of you the opportunity to kind of have a final bite of this mental capacity pie and, and give us, you know, some final thoughts that we can take away and use and then we'll wrap up. So whoever wants, I was going to say whoever has the biggest mouth wants the biggest bite of pie. <laughs> but um, in a slightly less insulting way, please decide amongst yourself who is going to have the final comment. Okay, so I'm going first because I, I think, again, um, Sophie is really the one who prepared the brief and, and should give you the, the last, uh, last thoughts of the webinar about how to use the brief and what to do with it. But I guess my message from Project Perfect um, is, is just to say that uh, let's try and think um, carefully about how we relate to people around us and, and not assume that the diagnosis um, of a mental disorder uh, of any kind means that the person is unable to make decisions for herself. I saw recently in the independent and opinion piece uh, by Patrick Cockburn suggesting that it is a pretense um, to assume that people with psychotic uh, symptoms can uh, make uh, any rational decisions about their lives. I think that is clearly an overstatement. We're not trying to romanticize or trivialize uh, mental health struggles, which are real. But what we want to say is any person um, with psychotic symptoms is different from the next person with psychotic symptoms. And let's please look at the individual and the circumstances and let's not be blinded by the associations that we have with a specific disorder or a specific uh, symptom. <laughs> 
Great. Cool. Um, I just have a, a, a short message to deliver to four different groups of people um, around this project. So we're very much at the start of this project. Um, and the, the brief is, is really kind of what we'd like to, you know, where we'd like to go next. So if you're a policymaker, please do read the brief and consider um, the recommendations we make there for the new code of practice, and um, particularly around prioritizing the functional aspect of the test. If you're a person with lived experience and you want to be involved and to offer your insights, um, do get in touch as well. Um, if you're a practitioner and you'd be interested in co-developing training that we discuss here, um, also please get involved. And finally, if you're a funding council, um, please call us up. We're, we'd love to have a chat with you over the phone. <laughs> Cheers. Excellent. That's a good point to finish on. Um, just like to say, we did have more questions than we could fit in in the hour. Um, so please do continue the conversation at Twitter on the hashtag Mental Capacity 2020, which is the numbers. I'd um, like to say thank you to Sophie and Lisa for this hour. It's been really useful. It's been really interesting. Um, I've really enjoyed it. It's a very important topic and I'm kind of very, very glad that we kind of pulled out some of the more itchy and difficult elements of it. Um, so I've been here, Mark Brown for Beyond the Room, and I'd like to thank everyone for watching at home. And um, should we give them all a wave to say goodbye? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.